Welcome to the Wildline Podcast. I'm your host, Dan. This is a podcast about movies and how much money they make at the box office. Today is going to be the weekend review for August 2nd through the 4th, 2019. Uh, we're at, sort of, this is like, is this the last weekend of the hol- of the summer season? It kind of feels like it a little bit. Um, but we did have a new wide release opener, Fast and the Furious Presents, Hobbs and Shaw. Um, we'll see how that one did. Did quite well, but perhaps not as well as Universal had hoped on its opening weekend here. Uh, Then we'll walk through the rest of the top 10 uh, and see. We had a lot of limited releases that are doing uh, interestingly well, so we'll talk about those as as we get through the top 10 here and maybe even talk about the top 20 and see what's going on there. And then we will see um, what's going to come out over the next few weeks to close out the summer, but let's dive right into this. Let's do it. Number one this weekend was Fast and the Furious, Hobbs and Shaw, from Universal. 60.8 million is the current uh, estimate for this weekend. Uh, super wide release opener, uh, 4,253 theaters uh, per theater average was about $14,300. Um, the budget on this was really high. Um, Deadline is saying $200 million for the budget and also $160 million for the global marketing budget. That's massive. That is absolutely huge. Um, you know, I've been talking a lot about marketing budgets more in the last year or so because I have be- a better data set on those and trying to estimate, you know, what a Toy Story 4 marketing campaign looks like versus Crawl. And they're completely different stories, obviously. If you're doing a wide release global film, you know, you're easily pushing to the 120s. I thought was kind of the norm. But this one going to 160 really makes me rethink that a little bit. Now, keep in mind, Universal knows this is a global property. It knows it's going to get a majority of its money from overseas. What the breakdown is going to be in terms of that domestic versus international take, I don't know. Maybe like these movies have gotten more and more global uh, and more they're t- taking more and more money from international um, audiences than uh, domestic U.S. Canada audiences over the last couple of films. You're looking at almost like a 70-30 split, 30% domestic, 70% international. For a normal movie these days, it's more like a 45-55 or a 40-60, but these tend to be skewed more global than that. Um, so that's probably why there's this huge, um, you know, absolutely massive global marketing campaign for this movie. But still, that's a lot of cash to throw at a spinoff of the Fast and the Furious series. So $60.8 million, um, that's kind of, uh, ex- that's what Universal, I think, said in tracking was right around then. I had thought it was going to go higher. I had thought that this thing was going to push up into the... Um, 80s, I thought I was going to say like 81, 82 million for this just because Fast and the Furious is such um, a beloved franchise. Now, it has changed a lot since Paul Walker passed away in that car crash. Um, the last one was just not good. It was really messy, schlocky, didn't really make a whole lot of sense um, why they took that. I mean, they took that approach, I guess, for global audiences, but it was a terrible action movie. I'm just going to be honest about that. It was not very good. Uh, and I'm pretty sort of, I'm not that critical of these movies because I know what they are. I went to go see Fast and the Furious opening weekend, the the first one when it came out. I remember that very distinctly. Capital Cinemas outside Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um and the vibe in that audience was completely sold out. It was like the 7.30 showing, the premiere showing Friday night. This is before they did Thursday previews. And uh, the vibe in that audience was just like, people were just ecstatic. People were really excited about it. And that sort of excitement has carried this series through, even sort of the darker times, like the Tokyo Drift one. And just the sequels that like just kept coming, but people keep showing up because of that just initial excitement that the series has created. And so with this offshoot, it does seem like it's running a little bit thin now, but I was excited about this one in terms of its box office take because of the Hobbs and Shaw angle. You get two different people in the series, pull them out, give them their own movie, especially Dwayne Johnson, who is, you know, maybe one of the last A-list movie action stars that we have right now uh, in an era where those don't really exist. Uh, so I thought this was going to push a little bit higher than, than the 60, 60 million gross, but I mean, it's not a terrible performance, but let's try and let's put it in context to see uh, where this stands with the rest of them, uh, the rest of this series. So the Fast and the Furious, like I just said, I saw opening weekend, that would have been uh, June 22nd, 2001. 
Um, that opened up at forty million dollars, closed out at one forty four. Let's try and get some adjusted numbers on this and see if this doesn't break. Oh, of course it broke. So I'm not going to give you. Oh wait, no, I do have adjusted numbers. Sweet. Um, so the adjusted on that is one hundred and forty four opening. So this is where it makes a lot more sense because when you say forty million dollar opening back in two thousand one. I'm, to me, because I'm, you know, in my late 30s now, mid to late 30s, um, 2001 doesn't seem that long ago, but it was 18 years ago, almost 20 years ago. So the inflation really does take an effect here. So Fast and the Furious, June 2001, opened at 144 adjusted, closed it at, at 230. So a really massive movie, especially for what it was. Uh, Too Fast, Too Furious then came two years later in June. Um, that opened up uh, adjusted at 127, closed out at 189 already seen diminishing returns. Um, but this is why it's such a fascinating series, the turnaround that it makes. So Too Fast, Too Furious, and then we have Fast and Furious Tokyo Drift, which is sort of the dark moment of this of this movie, just of the series, because it just didn't fit right. They tried to reboot with new characters. It just felt really kind of low rent and off and almost like a straight to DVD version of Fast and the Furious. Uh, but that did open up three years after the second one in June 2006. Uh, took in 62. So in reality, this is opening kind of right where Tokyo drifted at the lower end of this entire series. Um, and that adjusted to 62. I think these numbers are off. This is saying $80 million. Uh, $85 million it took total. What did it do unadjusted? So it took 62 unadjusted, so I can't do the math, but it wasn't a very good performance, the lowest of the series. Uh, then we have, I, I guess you would call that the reboot. Three years later in April 2009, we have Fast and the Furious, um, or Fast and Furious, sorry. this. So I, I forget how stupid that title was, and I was not maybe paying attention to movies all that much in 2009, but like the Fast and the Furious is the original Fast and Furious. I mean, no wonder I didn't see that movie. Uh, I think I saw it eventually, but it's just not not great. Um, so that unadjusted opened up at 70, closed it at 155. So then it's back on track. It's back on track to what the originals first two were doing. Then we had Fast Five come out two years later. Um, opens up at 86, closes at 209, even better. So now all of a sudden you start out at a peak. Second one goes down a little bit. Third one goes way down. The reboot fourth movie goes back up again to the where you want it to be, and now it starts taking off. So Fast and the Free Six opens up in May 2013. That one opens up at 97, closes out at 238. Uh, and the biggest one of the series, and this is sort of the last one that Paul Walker was in, the real send-off, was Furious 7. And that was four years ago in April 2015, opened up at 147, closed out at 353. Uh, and this is when really when the global take almost takes precedent here on uh, importance uh, just because that uh, Furious 7 especially was just a massive movie uh, worldwide. It went on to make that year $1.5 billion worldwide, uh, which is insane for a movie like the Fast and the Furious series. I mean, it was just kind of outrageous, but a lot of that was the goodwill or sort of respect to Paul Walker and the series and everybody kind of just felt like they had to go see it worldwide. Um, and so that was back in April 2017, uh, and so now we have Fast and the Furious, Hobbs and Shaw. I'm sorry, totally forgot the last movie, which is easy to forget. The Fate of the Furious came out in 2017, Furious 7 was 2015. Fate of the Furious is one of the most ridiculous movies I've ever seen in my life. The trailer was absurd. I watched the entire thing maybe twice, I think it was on HBO. Um, indecipherable what was happening from one moment to the next. The nuclear submarine is absolutely stupid. Uh, it was just so schlocky and cheesy, but not in a fun way. Kind of in like, hey, we're doing this to make a lot of money. Like that was clearly the intention there. It wasn't to make a good action movie or to make like great art or something. It was basically a payday for everybody, um, which whatever. I don't, you know, I can't really fault people for doing that. It's a good payday, right? Um, for not, you know, it's a lot of work, but not too much. <laughs> it's not like you're digging ditches, uh, making millions of dollars doing that, right? So. Uh, that was the last movie, uh, April 2017. Uh, kind of a low note there. Uh, opened up at 98, closed it at 226. I do not, I gotta figure out what this one did worldwide. I'm kind of fascinated by that. Still did 1.2 billion worldwide. Again, now this is, and I was wrong about this earlier in the show. This is really a globally foreign based franchise now. Uh, that the breakdown on that one, domestic was only 18%. For a movie over a billion dollars, 
to only have the domestic take 18%, this might be one of the the biggest disparities I've ever seen. It might be the biggest one, but don't quote me on that. So this is essentially an international movie that gets released to the United States kind of, you know, like whatever. We're going to make $200 million on this, but like we're going to make a billion overseas. Um, I don't know if that's going to be the case with Hobbs and Shaw. It does seem a little bit more domestic U.S. Canada focused, I would say. Uh, but it's open to like, I think like 180 already worldwide. Um, you know, it's definitely going to be a global product. And that's why they pushed that $160 million uh, marketing campaign for worldwide. Uh, what does Universal say on this? Universal is celebrating um, its fifth biggest global opening ever uh, behind Fate of the Furious, Jurassic World, Furious 7, Fifty Shades of Grey. Uh, so Hobson Shaw deba- debuted at uh, in the number one spot in 53 out of its 63 territories. So yeah, this is definitely uh, a worldwide movie. Uh, like I said, it cost 200 million bucks. Um, in a total uh, looked like 160 so total cost just up front is 360 on this uh deadline quotes some financial executives saying oh this is that seems a little bit too high it's a little that does sound very expensive for a movie like this um those are similar costs that you would see like with a new star wars movie or a new avengers endgame was kind of an exception but like a top tier marvel movie would be 200 plus 150 160 million dollar marketing and i don't think it's gonna make you know, the $2 billion worldwide, um, worldwide box office to break even. And this is again, deadline quoting some sources that they have. You're looking at $600 million worldwide. Um, and so let's see, I mean, I can kind of guess what it's going to do right now. This is not going to be very accurate, but I just like have fun doing it. Um, so it's at $60 million now. It's probably not going to have a great multiplier, uh, Fate of the Furious, ooh, that's a terrible multiplier. Uh, so that opened up at 98, closed out at 226 domestically at least. 2.3x multiplier, which is very low, but like it makes sense because that movie was straight up trash. Um, so if this is at 61, let's give it the extra 200k. Uh, it does a similar multiplier. I'm going to give it a little bit of an edge because I think Dwayne Johnson, uh, Jason Th- Statham have a little bit more of a holding power and worldwide status. I'm going to say, God, this thing closes out at 150. Um, 150, even if it has that same outrageous breakdown, domestic versus foreign, which it's not going to, uh, I'm going to give it 25% domestic uh, and see what that gets us. <laughs> That's hilarious. $600 million. So uh, it's to me right now, it's right at break even, right? Depending on how it does overseas, if it overperforms uh, in China and Brazil and Russia and all these other places, uh, it could make a little bit of a profit. But this is not going to be a big money maker for Universal uh, solely because they spent way too much money making it. Number one, number two, they spent so much money marketing this thing that it's going to be hard to make up a lot of that cash. You do have to take a step back and think, why are you spending the marketing thing is its own problem. But why are you spending $200 million to produce, just produce this movie? This should have capped out at like 120, 140, I would say, would be the total ceiling on a production budget like this. I don't know why, who was involved, all this sort of stuff. I'm obviously not a Hollywood accountant, um, but just relatively talking about this stuff and seeing the data, that does seem like a very high production budget for a movie like this, especially opening here uh, in the gutter of the summer in August. I don't know if there was any way this thing was going to do uh, enough to, you know, cruise past 600. And maybe I'm underestimating worldwide take. Maybe I'm underestimating foreign take. Uh, maybe it does. Maybe it gets, if it gets to $700 million. I think Universal will be happy. I don't see that happening, though, unfortunately. So this is kind of in a break even territory. Uh, who went to go see this man was 54%. You know, what we didn't talk about is um, the critics' viewpoint of it. Let's dive into that real quick. I did the hard work. Let's fucking let's talk about it. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes, 67%, uh, 61 out of 100. So, like, not uh, good at all, but, like, not terrible. Kind of in the middle there, just fret, barely fresh. Verified audience score is very high, 90%. Uh, 89 out of 100 actual score. All audience score is similar, 88%, 87 out of 100. So, audiences like it. Cinema score, a minus. Post track, 80%. Parents gave it 100%. Kids gave it 90%. So, that group really liked it. So, what I'm seeing so far is critics not super hot on it, but audiences really like it a lot. So that might help the legs a little bit that would propel it definitely past that two three, I would think. 
X multiplier, maybe two, four, two, five. Higher than that's going to be tough because it's a spinoff of a sequel of the like the seven sequel. That audience is getting smaller and smaller the more of those you make. Uh, in terms of what the letterboxed uh, crew is thinking, sixty-two out of a hundred, which makes sense. Uh, that's similar to Furious. Uh, Fate of the Furious was 60. Furious 7 was a 64. So it's in that sort of the past two movies range. Uh, in terms of Dwayne Johnson, he recently did Fighting with the Family. That's a 70 in Letterboxd, so definitely higher than than this. But uh, um, Skyscraper was in his last real big action movie, which was terrible 50 on Letterboxd, which I think is a really accurate score. So it's mm-hmm. definitely higher than that. Uh, Jason Statham uh, also had a 50 with Meg last year. Which made a lot of money, but was a terrible movie along with Skyscraper. Um, and maybe that's like some maybe like cultural bias going on because Letterbox people, they're not like, they're mostly US, I would say UK, Canada people. Uh, and Skyscraper and Meg were more meant for the Asian audience, specifically China. Uh, so maybe there's just like a difference in, in viewpoint there. But though those both those movies were seen as not being very good at all. Uh, and this one's above that but right in line with the fate of the furious sort of quality that people expect uh who showed up 54 percent men 46 percent women very typical of an average movie going audience um i would i would have expected the male audience to be more in like the high 50s low 60s uh but that didn't happen here under 25 was 53 percent over 25 was only 47 percent that's way over index on the under 25 crowd almost reverse of what it normally is for the average movie. So young people did show up for this, which I think is a, is a very good sign. Uh, in terms of the uh, racial breakdown uh, of who went, to, who went to go see this, 38% was white, which is very low, um, but typical to the series, it seems like. Uh, Latinos were at 25%, which is a little bit higher than normal audience. Uh, African Americans were at 22%, much higher than the average audience. Usually they're around 12 to 13%. Uh, Asian and other that grouping here that the MPA does fifteen uh, percent, which is double the normal take. So uh, it looks like African Americans and the Asian um, the demographic showed up a lot more than the white people for this. So I think, uh, and I think that's very typical of this series. I think it's one of those, like I said, it's kind of a global movie, uh, and it's not something that's just you know the boring white people in the middle of America go see. Like everybody's really excited to go see it. Uh, in the cosmopolitan big cities, uh, played very well in the West and South, um, which kind of makes sense. This feels like a West Coast movie. The whole Fast and the Furious obviously takes place in California. It does really feel like a West Coast franchise, uh, and so that has borne out here uh, um, with this performance of Hobbs and Shaw. So I think it overall, we really are not going to be able to tell until the international numbers start kicking in a lot more over the next few weeks. And then we'll, I'll keep an eye on the worldwide total for this one instead of just the domestic because it's so important to the movie's profitability that it does well overseas. Um, but for right now, it's kind of a break even. I think Universal is sort of like eh, kind of a meh reaction. Um, I, I, I'm i sure that they had thought this was going to do 70, 80. I'm, but when they talk to the press, it's like, oh, yeah, 60 is fine. Uh, it's really kind of not here in terms of expectations, but I think financially it's break even. Uh, and if it does really overperform uh, internationally, it could have a nice little profit for Universal. But not right now. It doesn't look like it right now. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, The Lion King, and uh, its third weekend, 50% drop. Kind of a high drop, to be honest with you. Uh, $38 million. Uh, it sits at $430 million so far. Um, so this one's going to cruise now to $500 million, half a billion. Um The drops are kind of high, so its legs might be a little bit lower than your typical animated children's film. Um, But it's a great performance overall. There's not much more you can say about it. Like, um, this is, it wasn't even a big bet. This is a no bet from Disney. Of course, we're going to remake The Lion King with uh, computer animation. Uh, Even though it's note for note and totally unnecessary on every level and kind of looks really weird. It doesn't matter. People are going to show up because they love Disney and love The Lion King. Uh, and that is the that is what happened. That is exactly what's happened. So it's going to easily hit the five hundred million dollar mark. Uh, it's had super strong weekdays, which is why those yeah. So maybe those drops are higher because of that on the weekends. But I think during the week it's just crushing. Um, but a great performance for that movie and and expected. Uh, number three this weekend was Once Upon a Time in Hollywood um, from Sony Quentin Tarantino's what is his ninth film? 
uh, $20 million, a 51% drop, a little bit higher than I would want there. Um, it, I would expect something like 45% if its legs were going to be like fantastic, like 3x or over. Um, but it's not the worst thing in the world. It's not like a 55 or 60% drop. So people are still going out to see this uh, in numbers. Uh, per theater average in its second weekend is 5,400. Still in about 3,700 theaters. Uh, total take so far for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And this is a number I just I was just looking at. I just saw it now. I was like, wow, that's really high. $78 million so far. Um, so I think it costs a lot to make. It costs $90 million to make. Marketing for this worldwide? I have no idea. I could not even remotely tell you. I don't know. $70 million, $120 million? I have no clue um, what it would be. And I think they're trying to push it out really hard worldwide. Um, and uh, so I don't know. I... I financially let's see what it's doing all over the place here um all over the world it's only been released in the united states so far so that's why it's sitting at that um uh with no international take oh yeah i forgot last week i did find the production budget was 110 million or marketing budget was 110 million dollars for that so all in you're looking at 200 million dollars that just seems really high for a movie like this and without international numbers, I just have no idea what that $78 million means in its second weekend. I think it's a good performance domestically based on expectations. But, like, you're going to have to make up a lot of cash. Like, you're probably going to have to pull in. If I'm just doing just super general calculations, um, going to have to pull in eh, probably $270 million in revenue overall to make it work. Uh, and if I'm using kind of the deadline formula, maybe probably about $300 million worldwide to break even or get into the, uh, profit territory. I don't think that's going to happen. Right. Um, so I don't know, maybe there's some different calculations that they're doing on the accounting side to make it work. Um, but it does seem like a really high cost, but at the end of the day, it's performing quite well. If you had removed the budget context here and marketing context of 110 million, this feels kind of like a smash hit, but with that high cost, it's kind of like, it feels almost like a push right now, kind of like Fast and the Furious, Hobbs and Shaw. But in any event, uh, it is performing quite well. Um, we'll see if it can catch up to its costs. Then we have uh, Spider-Man Far From Home here in fourth, 7.7 .7 million, God, 37% drop. It's just like Homecoming, having one of those fantastic marathon runs. Uh, starting to lose theaters, lost 104. Uh, total right now sits at 360 um, million. It wasn't doing internationally right now. This is a big win for Sony, and I think it's uh, you know it's the foundation of the Sony Cinematic Marvel Universe, whatever the hell you want to call it. Uh, it just broke a billion dollars worldwide. Really fantastic performance. One of the better performances of the summer. Not that surprising, but I think the um, magnitude of the success is a little bit surprising there. So great performance for Spider-Man Far From Home. Um, number five was Toy Story 4, uh, obviously from Disney, 7.1 million, great drop, 31% drop. Uh, losing theaters now in its seventh weekend, it sits at 410. I mean, come on, like Disney's got to be so happy with this summary of Lion King, Toy Story 4, Aladdin, all still in the top 10. All, I mean, Aladdin's probably not going to break 400 million, but like all kind of, you know, Toy Story 4 maybe didn't exceed expectations, kind of fit them, but the expectations were already so high, so it's a win. They're all Grand Slams. And so Disney is really having their banner year. Obviously, this is all leading up to the Disney Plus launch in November, which is going to be massive and huge. Uh, it's really going to change, I think, the entertainment landscape for a while. Um, with them opening up, I think Netflix is really going to get hurt. They also, Disney, don't forget, also owns Hulu, which is also another one of the biggest streaming giants uh, that are out there right now. So they... they <laughs> Depends on who gets in the White House in 2020. If a Democrat gets in the White House, they are going to be the target of some antitrust, uh, I think, investigations at least, just because they're going to own so much. Um, okay, so um, that was Toy Story 4. Number six was Yesterday. Um, still sticking around. What did I say? I call. I mean, did I call this one? I think I called this one. I'm pretty sure I called it. I knew I knew something was special about this. The time I well, the moment I talked about this in the podcast when I saw that TV commercial where it's literally just an interviewer talking to people about Beatles music. And you're like, wait, what is, is this an infomercial? What the freak is going on here? But it was for you for yesterday. And I was like, oh, this is going to work. Like they're finding a way to make this super bizarre Danny Boyle movie make sense to people. And it, it actually worked. Uh, so at a 20% drop this weekend in its sixth weekend, 
2.4 million. That total sits at $67 million right now domestically. Internationally, it is at $118 million. That's a big win. Production budget on this was only $26 million. Um, huge win. I wonder how they got the Beatles music. Dude. I wonder if they gave like a back end deal to like Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr or whoever owns. I guess, does Michael Jackson buy the catalog? He's gone, so I don't wonder who owns it now. Jackson family? Um, maybe they bought it back. Um, anyway, yesterday I think is one of the bigger stories of the year so far in that you can make a sort of um, mid, it's not even necessarily mid tier. This is something I don't see very often. It's like a lower tier film in terms of its budget. Twenty six million dollars is not all that much for a major release compared to like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood was you know three x that and more. Uh, Spider Man Far From Home was one sixty. Fast and the Furious was two hundred. Uh, so I think yesterday in Universal is going to see quite a return on their investment for this movie. Um, but I think a lot of that had to do with the marketing campaign and trying to sell something that seemed kind of just totally off the wall, but it worked. Um, number seven, I think another big story of the year, uh, kind of a silver lining to all of the limited released chaos that we've seen, like thinking about like Book Smart and, um, and Late Night that just were obviously very good movies, but never could find an audience and didn't find an audience on wide release. The Farewell from A24 is kind of proving the point that you can still do a platform release and have it make some money. Um, maybe not the same amount of money, but it, it is making some cash here. So it did 2.4 this weekend and it's fourth weekend. It's only in 400 theaters. It's per theater average is $6,000. Um, you know, that puts it in line with like the Lion King on its third weekend or once upon a time on its second weekend. It's in that range. Again, 400 theaters, so it's totally different than 4,000 or 5,000 theaters, which is what The Lion King is on. But it's sort of, you know, it's a point that, like, you can sort of slowly release these films and spread them out um, and slowly add more theaters and still make some money on it. You know, you don't have to push it out to 2,000 theaters right away like they did with Late Night and Booksmart. And that just didn't work because the problem there is, like, I've been talking about The Farewell for over a month since it's been released, and it's been nothing but good news. Booksmart and Late Night was bad news the night it got released. It was just bad news all the way through the weekend. Think pieces like one that I wrote uh, that like, why is this failing? Why is this failing? They even tried to bring Booksmart back out. I think like last week or two weeks ago also failed again. Second time. Um, So there's just and you got you have to wonder why. Like, what's the difference between this type of rollout versus OK, like let's use Late Night for an example. Uh, Amazon Studios. I forget who they released it through. It doesn't matter. Um. So what was happening, the difference here is this. So with The Farewell, I think The Farewell is 10 times harder to sell than Late Night, 100 times harder to sell than Booksmart. Um, It's a movie about a Chinese family who essentially, uh, and this is something I I think that is somewhat common in Chinese culture. I don't really know. I can't really say, but I've heard that and sort of reading articles about this. Uh, The grandmother becomes terminally ill. She doesn't have long to live. And they basically lie to her. And say, don't tell her that she's dying and don't tell her that she doesn't have long to live in order for her to sort of enjoy the last few months of her life. Uh, It's a very sort of, you know, it's a very arty film. It's an adult drama. These aren't very hard sells now today. The box office where you have Hobbs and Shaw, Lion King and Spider-Man and Toy Story dominating. So this type of story is not an easy sell. But A24 is one of the better studios out there today and they're newer as well. Um, on sort of advertising these in the right way and releasing them in the right way. So right now, The Farewell since at $6.8 million. The big question, I think Deadline um, sort of said this in their little write-up this weekend, is you know where does it go from here? Uh, do they just, it added 274 theaters this weekend. That's a big ad for this movie. Do you keep trying to do that and keep rolling it out that way um, so that it could play technically, if it keeps that per theater average up, it could play for a couple more months, a few more months. It could play maybe even through uh, the holidays, possibly. Um, that's the question. Or I think Deadlight Sun, do you just push this thing out wide right now? Like you've done a month of limited. Let's push it out wide, make as much money as we can. Anybody who wants to see it, because I've, I've heard multiple people online complaining that like they really want to see this movie, but it's not playing in their state. You know, 400 theaters is not that many um, uh, throughout the U.S. and Canada. So there's a lot of people that want to see this who can't right now because it's not it's not playing anywhere near them. Do you push it out wide or you keep the platform? I mean, in my I'm like, I'm not an expert, obviously. I don't work at A24 and 
you know, I don't work on distributing films, but just on my, you know, sort of reading the data and looking at the numbers consistently for a long time, uh, it seems to me that like a wide release is really never going to work for something like this. Um, to me, it's more of a roadshow model where you keep testing it in different theaters. The reality is it, you have essentially, before it goes on digital, you have two more months, technically. And obviously, A24 can push that out uh, if they wanted to. Um, but you got a good eight weeks left to make a lot of cash, or you have to push the digital release out a little bit more. I would just, I would keep playing this thing. I would, I would push out the digital release for like six months after opening day because it's a limited release. And I think you can just do that. Like A24 can do what they want there. Uh, although they might have a contractual obligation with the creators to push it out in 90 days. Who knows? Um, and you keep playing it in, you find every basically art theater in the US and Canada and you put it in there for a couple of weeks or a month uh, and just make that money. And don't, you know, like maybe you don't even worry about the mall theater in Omaha or San Antonio or, you know, Iowa City or something like that. Like maybe you don't worry about that audience, the suburban, exurb audience. Uh, to make your money like just to keep playing it uh, in places where people want to see it and just push out that digital release and see what you can do um, it might reach a tipping point where you can push it into the mall theater in Omaha and someone's going to show up because right now and deadline states this too it's not doing all that well in those sort of non-cosmopolitan markets and so uh, I yeah, I think that's the route that I would go. Look, does that make any sense to A24, the people involved? Maybe not. But to me, it's like you're only going to increase the cachet and clout of the film the longer you play it and the longer it is successful. The aggregate amount doesn't matter all that much because you're already at $7 million. That's more than you could ever expect from a movie like this. If it gets $10, $12 million, it's a pretty big success. But you do line up the possibility of a really massive breakout where it could hit 30, 40, 50 million dollars. And who knows, maybe it gets awards contention and becomes a real smash hit. Uh, that's just my thought process for all. But I think overall, it is, it, it's a huge success story and proves that you can platform release a film and it still works for it to make money. And more importantly, to increase its sort of presence and hype around the movie um, that will that will play out. Uh, when people buy it on VOD and rent it on VOD, when they die a digital copy and when they stream it and increases its streaming price when they sell it to Netflix or I think in this case, Amazon Prime. Uh, so just, yeah, good story on that one yesterday. Also a good story. Uh, number eight, Crawl, uh, 2.1 million, 47% drop here, uh, just over $1,000 per theater. So that's kind of ending its run uh, pretty soon here sitting at 36 again talked about that one at length could have made a lot more money it's a good movie it sounds like uh that easily should have made 50 million dollars domestically aladdin still sticking around number nine uh 2.1 million uh 47 drop there uh, sitting at um i'm sorry 33 percent drop still having the low drops 350 million dollars worldwide i do believe it just passed a billion worldwide do you think that was last weekend oh yeah just well just passed a billion this week it looks like uh, so uh, great performance there from Aladdin number 10 Annabelle comes home what I've been saying about this movie it's just printing money is it good who knows does it matter it's Annabelle it's Warner Brothers new line it's the Conjuring Cinematic Universe people are going to show up um, you get the original characters in there it made 875,000 this weekend a 43% drop it really is ending its run it's under 1,000 theaters lost 368 this weekend uh, per theater average is still 952 just under 1,000 Total take seventy-one million dollars. Seventy-one million dollars. Uh, seventy-one million dollars. Can I talk? Uh, so it's a huge win. Uh, I don't know how much it costs to make. I don't know how much it costs to market. But I know that Warner Brothers isn't going to spend a ton of money on it. Uh, and seventy-one million uh, is great. Let's look at it internationally. See how it's doing. Oh my god, <laughs> two hundred and eleven million dollars worldwide on Annabelle Comes Home. I mean, they're just they know what they're doing over there. I love the Conjuring Cinematic Universe because. It's just like the cheap knockoff version of MCU. The movies cost like one tenth of what the MCU movies do. They don't make the same amount, but they just make enough where it's like this huge profit. Um, and we'll see where that goes. I mean, I, is the steam going to run out in the whole thing? Maybe the nun was too much. La Llorona was like not great. La Llorona had so much potential too because you had a great cast, great actors, great kid actors too. 
Um, and just the, the last half hour of that movie was like, what, what is this about? This is ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, just really poorly written. I think the last, or probably the whole script, but the last half hour, that was a mess. Um, so we'll see if it runs out of steam. doesn't look like it is right now. Annabelle comes home, you know, with the third Annabelle sequel, which is a prequel to The Conjuring. So I don't know, whatever. It's hard to, to unwrap all that, but a really big win for Annabelle. Okay, that's the top 10, folks. Uh, also the top 10, Secret Lights of Pets 2, Stuber, Midsummer, Rocket Man, Maiden. Uh, Loose is a new limited release from Neon. Uh, opened up in five theaters. One extra than your normal platform release. Probably an extra one in Los Angeles, I would guess. Um, 26K per theater. That will not break out. Not high enough. Need to break the 40K usually to break out of those. The New York, Los Angeles audience. That does not look like it's going to happen. Uh, for Loose. What else was, uh, there's a lot of 11th releases. Tel Aviv on Fire, 11 theaters, uh, $4,000, $600 per theater, not going anywhere. Uh, Jay Myself, uh, one theater, did 19 k not really going anywhere. Them That Follow, I don't even know what that is. Three theaters did 5 k per theater. Um, there's a new Piranhas movie, what, from Mbox? Who, who is releasing this stuff? I guess it's a crime drama. I thought it was like the... The horror movie, another like a reboot of the horror movie. Um, any other limited releases? There's a lot of stuff like Echo in the Canyon, David Crosby. I told you that one's not going to do well. It's only twenty six hundred dollars per theater in twenty nine theaters, going nowhere. Uh, our self defense kind of petered out, although it surprisingly did make two point three million. I think a lot of that had to do with the Artisan series that AMC sort of selected that for, so it was able to make that extra cash through that. Uh, Wild Rose from Dion. Um, Really close it out here, probably about 1.5 million total. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's kind of a weird. Uh, oh, Maiden, that's another one. I don't know that one either. Um, 1700. It's like nothing's really limited releases, they're just not really. I don't know. Are these wins, these losses? They just want to get in the theater because none of them are breaking out outside the farewell. Uh, and it's a pretty big breakout for that movie. In any event, that's top 10 some limited release talk. Let's see what's going on this weekend or next weekend. Uh, let's see, we have Art of Racing in the Rain. That could actually kind of, I saw the trailer to that one. It's a dog movie. He doesn't love dog movies. That could do okay next weekend. Brian Banks, don't really know that much about that one from Bleecker Street, 1,500 theaters. Uh, Door in the Lost City of Gold, I think 3,500 theaters from Paramount. That could be pretty strong. Uh, the Kitchen looks kind of good from Warner Brothers New Line, uh, 27 plus, uh, maybe like 3,000 theaters. And Scary, uh, scary Stuff, <laughs> Not today is like the worst. Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark from Lionsgate, 3,000 theaters, a lot of releases next weekend, which is surprising for this, you know, it is the gutter slot of the summer, like, from here on till, you know, when school starts for a lot of people, which can be, like, even, like, next week, like, colleges start, I think, a week from now, uh, and then, like, grade schools, they can start anywhere from, like, two weeks before Labor Day to the week after Labor Day, so it's all kind of a big transition time for everybody. It is surprising that releasing this many wide releases in this time spot. And then the week after the 16th, we have four more wide releases. Uh, 47 meters down, uncaged. Who knows if that's going to repeat the success of the first one? I th- I thought earlier this year it was, but now I'm kind of like, I haven't seen a ton about it. It kind of, the, the vibe of the summer has changed a bit. I don't know how that's going to do. Blind Up of the Light, look out for that one. Could break out from Wonder Brothers. Similar to the yesterday's type of um, success it could have. Uh, but we'll see on that. Good Boys um, from Universal. Seth Rogen, I think, is involved in that one. That just looks freaking stupid. It reminds me of that movie, um, Problem Child. Uh, where'd you go, Bernadette? Uh, it's United Art- Artists releasing, so you can know it's going to bomb right away because they apparently don't know how to release films. Uh, although that one looks very interesting. I, mean, I shouldn't disparage them or whatever, but like, it looks like a really fascinating film. I'm probably going to watch it when it hits streaming. I'll probably rent it. Uh, but no one's going to go out to theaters to see this movie on August 16th. There's no way. Uh, Angry Movie or Angry Birds 2 movie uh, on the 14th of August. Uh, Angel has fallen and Overcomer on the 23rd. Ready or Not on the 21st, which looks really close to The Hunt from Blumhouse. But Ready or Not's coming out a month earlier from Fox Searchlight. I don't know. It's basically the take on the most dangerous game, both of them. Uh, Ready or Not open on the 21st. I don't think it's going to do anything. It might be surprising. Everybody's going to be like going back to school or whatever on vacation. I, I highly doubt it's going to break out, unfortunately. Although it looks like a good movie. Uh, on the 30th, don't go. And uh, I think that's mostly it. 
Uh, and then we have it. So basically, a ton of wide releases. This is definitely the next two weeks is throwing spaghetti on the wall to see what sticks from the major studios. Uh, because none of these necessarily look like huge winners. I mean, Dora the Explorer probably looks like the surest bet of everything coming out in the next two weeks. And then maybe The Kitchen. Um, the rest are kind of, I don't know. Is there scary stories to tell in the dark looks terrible. Um, but it might it has an, an amazing following probably, especially people my age. But I'm not going to go see that in a the theater. Why would I? Even though I had kids, I don't know if I'd take them. It looks like a terrible movie. It's Lionsgate. Uh, Art of Race in the Rain, maybe... But yeah, it's 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 actually going to be really exciting next couple of weeks to talk about because I have no idea how any of these films are going to do. I don't think any of these studios have any idea what they're going to do. And that's why they're releasing them in this sort of second and third weekend of August because it's just, it, I guess it's experimental time. Um, and that's it. And then, you know, everything's kind of crazy uh, and all over the place until we hit it. It's the next Surefire, uh, surefire massive hit. Um, Where's that going to end up? I don't know. Uh, the first one did like, what, 120 something? Opening, which is like the biggest horror opening ever and was a huge surprise to everybody. I thought it was really cool that it did that. Uh, it was a really kind of awesome weekend following that one. Uh, it too, I feel like it might do something very similar in terms of opening. Normally with a sequel like this, you're thinking it's going to go higher. I don't know. I have my doubts. I'm thinking like a 90 to 120. I think I might actually go below the first one because the first one was just this lightning in the bottle moment. Everybody was talking about it for six months before it released. That's not the same with this one, um, but we'll see. Maybe the hype does carry it past that 120 mark in the 130s. We'll see, which is an amazing, which is unbelievable for a horror film, by the way, because horror films used to be measured by the standard where it's like, if you make $100 million domestically, obviously inflation has changed just a bit, but if you made like $100, $120 million domestically, it was a big win for your film if you're a horror film because you know you made it for five, 10 million bucks, 20 million bucks. So it's, you know you make $100 million, it's awesome. With it, chapter two opening over well over a hundred million dollars, it just changed the entire ball game from the genre. Uh, really, never ever see that happen, but it did make it happen. So, the question is: It kind of a one-off? Are we not going to see horror films? But then you have us. I mean, us was a horror film massively. So, I really do think um, it and Get Out and Split. Uh, and maybe even a quiet place too. We can label that horror have have changed the genre pretty dramatically. That now it's like a blockbuster contender. Uh, they have Goldfish, Hustlers, which I think could do pretty well. What else is in September? Just really quickly, I just love going through the future films. Ad Astra, Rambo: Last Blood, Abominable, The Hunt. I'm gonna look at October. Why not? I should do a, a fall movie preview here pretty soon. A uh, Joker, Woman in the Window. What the hell is War? I don't know that one. Adam's Family, Gemini Man, Jexy, um, an untitled Ben Affleck movie is going wide October 18th. Does anybody know about this? Zombieland 2, uh, Jay and Silent Bob reboot, uh, Black and Blue Countdown, The Last Full Measure. I don't know about a lot of these movies, uh, but it should make for a pretty interesting um, early fall here. So I'll definitely do a, a fall movie preview maybe when things get really quiet, like the last weekend of August. In any event, thanks for listening, folks. This has been the Wildline Podcast. Mm-hmm.